Thanks very much, Stuart, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to talk at this session. Uh, as Stuart mentioned, we're going to talk about OCT and glaucoma. OCT is becoming increasingly used in our rooms in a variety of conditions. And looking specifically at the glaucoma application, the current uh, OCT machines have ganglion cell modalities on it, which can give us some extra information about uh, what's going on with the optic nerve. So a couple of general points first, um, and why ganglion cell may give us an advantage or, or in, uh, uh, as something to add into the nerve fibre layer analysis. 50% of the 1 million or so retinal ganglion cells are within 4.5 millimetres of the fovea. There's less variability of the ganglion cells in the parafoveal location than elsewhere in the retina, and uh, there is quite a lot of variability of the retinal nerve fibre layer axons in the region of the optic nerve. So looking specifically in the macula area, where there's algorithms on the current machines to, to break down the inner retinal layers and come up with the ganglion cell uh, layers, this can give us printouts which we can use to try and assess for early signs of glaucoma. Now, the different machines measure slightly different things. Um, the cases I'm going to present to you are basically from the Cirrus and the NIDEC machines, which we've had um, access to at Macquarie. Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of different examples in the different categories of where this can be useful. And firstly, I think it's very useful in cases of pre-parametric disease. So this first case is a patient with normal tension glaucoma. The disc photos are shown there. They've got normal fields, and I've been following this patient for a while and seeing these suspicious discs, the Drans hemorrhage, one in each eye at various locations. And um, so, so these are the sort of patients that you, you want to start them on treatment for glaucoma, but you also want to help monitor them before they get a field defect. So this is the ICT on the Cirrus. Uh, we've got the, the, the more traditional disc and nerve fiber imaging, which you're probably all familiar with on uh, this side here, flagging areas, especially inferiorly in the left optic disc. And then this is the ganglion cell analysis here, flagging a corresponding area here, and possibly also something on the right, although that's very early and hard to tell. Uh, I've got another patient which uh, shows the following of the ganglion cell defect. Uh, this is a 34-year-old female, slightly unusual. She's got a strong family history of glaucoma at a young age, and she's had very high pressures and is on maximal therapy. Uh, she's also had bilateral SLT, and the question was whether or not to proceed with surgery. And her discs look fairly normal clinically, and her field testing is full, including the, the C to swap. This is a, a disc nerve fibre layer imaging on the... On the um, NIDEC machine, and there's a slight area flagged, but a very small slight area flagged in the infrotemporal area of the left optic disc. First, first glance, you may not think that's particularly significant, um, but then looking then at the ganglion cell analysis, uh, there's a, an area here which corresponds to that, showing some dropout, and then following that a year later, that area is increasing and another bit up the top as well. So I think in cases like this where we're looking for early damage in a younger person, it can be very useful to monitor. <coughs> Sorry, that, that, was, that was the initial scan, this is the follow-up. This is the follow-up here, showing that's the first one there, and then a year later, it, the defect's increasing. This next case is a 57-year-old man who's got primary open angle glaucoma, but very asymmetric pressures with high pressures in the right eye. Uh, he's been on treatment for four years and still has a normal field, and has had difficult to control pressure and required multiple drops and is experiencing side effects. The disc nerve fibre layer imaging here shows the asymmetry between the right and left eyes on the nerve fibre layer imaging. The right, which is the more affected eye, is only borderline in some of the nerve fibre defects. But then when you combine this with the ganglion cell analysis, there's quite extensive dropout in the right macular area. And this is uh, highlighting, helping to highlight in a qualitative sense, these defects shown on the nerve fibre layer can be more magnified when we image the ganglion cell region. This next patient has large discs. The right looks possibly normal or a bit suspicious. The left's got early inferior change. Field test is still basically normal in both eyes. Imaging the nerve fibre layer um, on the Cirrus and the NIDEC, there's a small borderline area on the left side in both. But then while this area is small, when we then do the ganglion cell imaging, there's a much larger defect on the left side. And this actually corresponds with this early nasal step as well. 
Which brings me on to the next point about the usefulness of the ganglion cell imaging, that there's often a good structure function correlate um, when you do get field defects a little bit later on. This patient's a 48-year-old female who's got normal tension glaucoma, classic normal tension type risk factors, cold hands and feet, low blood pressure, and she's on treatment with three, three agents. The, because they're young and um, the, with the photography, you can see the nerve fibre drop out on the photo, inferiorly in both. But what I want to show you, and this is confirmed on the OCT, with the inferior nerve fibre layer thinning in both eyes. But then when we do the ganglion cell, we can see these areas here on the right and the left, which actually correspond very well to her visual field defects. And so in this left one, there's two separate bundle defects with a paracentral arcuate, little arcuate scotoma that doesn't actually show up on the 24 degrees, but actually shows up on the 10 too. This nascent case is slightly unusual. It's a 50-year-old man with a hypermetrope who's got a plateau iris and has had bilateral iridotomies. Actually, in reference to Rydia's talk, he'd probably do well with some anterior segment imaging to work out what's going on because he's still progressing uh, on full medical treatment, including pilocarpine, uh, progressing at low pressures and um, thinking maybe he's got a normal tension component as well, maybe pressure spiking. He's got quite advanced field loss in the right eye or central field loss. There's quite advanced disc change in the right eye. The left eye looks fairly normal, but there's a quite a prominent trans hemorrhage. If you didn't have that hemorrhage there in the left, it would look fairly normal, I'd think. He's got some early field defects on the left side. The, looking at the disc and nerve fibre layer imaging on two of the machines we had available, there's an inferior dropout in the right, superior dropout uh, in the left. And so in that region of the, where the disc hemorrhage was, there's already quite a bit of nerve fibre layer dropout. But then looking at the ganglion cell, on, again on the cirrus and the nidec, there's a large areas of dropout inferiorly on the right and superiorly on the left. And these ganglion cell scans emphasise the dropout associated with those peripapillary nerve fibre layer changes. Further point, if I can take you back to his fields, this was in February of last year when we first saw the Drance hemorrhage and there was a very early field defect on the, the left 24-2. Um, and then we did attend to, and there was a little bit there as well. Um, the patient was actually very reliable in reporting these um, scotomas. Um, then, if we go to his field in August, that field defect had progressed to a significant one there, quite central. If you go back to the scan in February, these ganglion cell, one on the NIDEC and one on the cirrus there, these actually predicted the field defect that was subsequently going to develop. Um, so I've shown you where the ganglion cell can be quite useful in preparametric glaucoma and also cases with early field defects. There's a couple of limitations that's worth discussing when we uh, talk about this technology and there, there is cases of false positives. I'm just going to give you an example where it was less helpful and where I would have liked it to be more helpful. It's a 44-year-old male who's an ex myop who's had LASIK. So he was in the classic risk factor for pigment dispersion, pigmentary glaucoma and he'd had demonstrated pressure spikes. The complicating factor is that he had a thin corneal thickness, so we're measuring a low pressure and we don't know really what his true pressure is. And he also has these my large-ish myopic discs, which are a bit difficult to assess. So uh, to try and uh, determine whether there's superimposed glaucoma does change or not can be tricky. He's got normal fields, but we know that there can be a lot of nerve loss before they get a field defect. And we're not really sure what level of pressure we want in view of his thin corneas. So looking at his scan, this is a disc nerve fibre layer scan, which is relatively normal. And then looking at his ganglion cell, there's areas lighting up, but it's a very symmetrical pattern in both. And so very symmetrical, and they don't really correspond to anything in the, happening in the nerve fibre layer. And I'd suggest that's a false positive and would suggest caution when interpreting uh, these ganglion cell scans when you've got a basically normal nerve fibre layer. And the false positives of the ganglion cell analysis in myopes has been reported, and it's actually quite high, the chance of having a false positive scan in healthy, non-glaucomatous myopic eyes. The conclusion from this paper from 2012 that was the cl clinician should rely more on clinical judgment than on the current imaging techniques. Now, 
the limitation of glaucoma, of ganglion cell analysis in myopsis is being looked at and work's been reported in our own journal about uh, looking at the ratio between the ganglion cell complex on the OptiView and looking at the ratio between that and the overall retinal thickness to try and confound for this, uh, sorry, to control for this rather, and it, it suggested this may be a more sensitive marker for early glaucomatous loss and reduce fa false positives. And the NIDIC are working on their normative database to try and get a different normative database for MyOp to try and eliminate the false positives. <coughs> the other de determinants of uh, the ganglion cell thickness in the macula, it's, as well as the uh, axial length and um, <coughs> refractive state, it's also independently associated uh, to be thinner with older age and with females, and also with the thinner retinal nerve fiber layer. I'm just going to show you an example of trying to use this imaging in an older patient who had normal pressures but suspicious discs, and we were unsure whether to start treatment or not. The fields were a bit nonspecific, and they had noted it, we had noted a trans hemorrhage in the past. So there were some abnormalities flagged on his disc and retinal nerve fibre layer, as shown. You've probably seen these when you're having these scans. And you're not sure whether these are true defects or whether it's a confounding factor of the large disc. And then looking at the ganglion cell, we've got this, this diffuse loss bilaterally, which you wouldn't really see in an early glaucoma, and this is more likely to be associated with the diffuse thinning of the macular area. So it makes, makes it less useful in cases such as these. And just comparing this patient, his, uh, the, the macula scan, which you're more familiar with, just shows normal macular contours, but very thin maculae generally, so it's a limitation of using these scans. And just a reminder that macular issues can also affect your retinal nerve fibre layer scan. So even when you're just scanning the disc and the peripapillary nerve fibre layer, this is a, a lady who's 88, she's on treatment for glaucoma, she's got the typically glaucomatous discs, yet when you image her nerve fibre layer, it's actually in the normal range or even supranormal. And the reason of this is that there's an epiretinal membrane, if you look at her macula, that's elevating the whole area. So to try and draw together some themes from these cases, um, I've found the major advantage, advantages of the, glaucoma, uh, the ganglion cell analysis is that it's good for preparametric disease or when the fields are unreliable. And furthermore, where the field defect is present, there is a better structure function correlate in certain cases. I've also found in a qualitative sense, the ganglion cell analysis can help appreciate the significance of an apparent small nerve fibre layer defect. The disadvantages and limitations, as with all imaging, is whether when you've got poor quality scans, that can affect uh, the, use, the usefulness of it. Axial myopia, as I mentioned, is one of the main limitations, and unfortunately, these are often the cases that are referred as glaucoma suspects or uh, NTG type cases. Coexistent macular pathology limits its usefulness, and it's less useful in the elderly. And so to sum up, it's a, it can be a sensitive marker for early glaucomatous change, and this is starting to come out and be reported in the literature. Um, and it can correlate well with visual field defects, but this is not always the case because of redundancy of the pathways. It really works best in younger patients with healthy maculae, and the discs which are harder to pick clinically are often the ones that are difficult for the imaging devices as well. So it's important to uh, maintain our clinical skills and disc and nerve fibre layer assessment. And just to, to finish up, if an apparent GCL defect doesn't correspond to any nerve fibre layer defect at all, then I'd interpret that with caution. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks, David. Some very nice examples there.